Welcome to Healthcare by the Numbers, a podcast that uncovers what's driving healthcare transformation. Join us each episode as Caravan Health leaders interview the brightest minds inspiring healthcare innovation and discuss the numbers which have shaped their thinking. Welcome, everyone. I'm your host, Todd Searles, Vice President for Business Development at Caravan Health, and this is Healthcare by the Numbers, a podcast that explores the numbers driving change throughout our industry. To learn more about Caravan Health, this podcast, and to check out episodes of the show, visit caravanhealth.com. And be sure to sign up for our newsletter to be notified of future episodes. You can also visit our program page on Healthcare Now Radio and follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook under our username at Caravan Health. Today, we're talking with Jessica Kim Cohen, Modern Healthcare's health and technology reporter, about innovations in digital health and, and how new healthcare technologies are really changing the way we experience healthcare. Uh, I think we all know when delivery methodologies change, it obviously trickles down to the patient provider experience and, and perhaps ultimately even the outcomes. Jessica has covered health technology and transformation for modern healthcare since February of 2019. And she writes about topics such as AI, drones, medical software that physicians aren't always that excited about, because let's face it, change isn't always easy. And most physicians didn't become doctors to, as we all know, work in IT. At Caravan Health, we specialize in helping community health systems transform care delivery, save money, and improve care quality through accountable care. And increasingly, we see technology entering the picture. As healthcare continues to shift towards a technological future and digital delivery, I'm excited to talk about this with you, Jessica. I think the role of technology and your views on what you're seeing across this industry uh, will, be, will be not only interesting, but perhaps shed some answers on questions as to, you know, where is the future of healthcare going as it relates to the integration of tech in the everyday of patient care and patient um, improved outcomes. So welcome to the podcast, Jessica. Hi, Todd. Happy to be here. Oh, I, uh, I, I know that you have so many topics that you cover, um, and you've come at this from a pretty, uh, you know, a, a pretty well-published background. You've been published in the Chicago Reader, the Chicago Health Magazine, uh, Baltimore City uh, Paper, Baltimore Magazine, and other regional news outlets. Uh, as I mentioned, you currently report for Modern Healthcare, I believe, where your audience consists of hospitals and healthcare executives. You provide resources for healthcare business, policy news, healthcare trends. And I think clearly in the age of digital health, those trends people are paying a lot more attention to. Uh, before joining Modern Healthcare, you worked with Becker's Hospital Review. And I believe it was there that you explored an expansive roster of technology topics. So I'm, I'm kind of curious if perhaps you could start us out um, before we jump into the numbers is perhaps just give us a little bit of background as to how you came into this space, how you, you know, how you work through Becker's and, and when you latched on to health IT as, as your primary focus. Definitely appreciate you asking. I, I had always wanted to go into healthcare reporting. That was a goal of mine ever since college, just felt like healthcare is such an important topic, something that touches everyone's lives. So was really mostly focused on applying healthcare positions right out of school and was able to get the role at Becker's Hospital Review. It was kind of a general assignment reporting role to start. And in my personal life, uh, I had never thought about going into technology reporting specifically, but I was always really interested in technology. It's something I was always reading about, listening to podcasts about. Um, my sister's a software engineer, so was always talking about tech topics. And then at Becker's Hospital Re Review, a few months after I joined the uh, technology reporter there, I uh, ended up leaving for a different role. So that position was open and I tried a few uh, technology stories, really loved the beat, was so fascinated by everything it encompasses, uh, digital health, uh, software systems like EHRs, um, the digital divide with internet connectivity and how that affects people's health outcomes. So was able to kind of stick in that beat. And then in 2019, I 
moved on to modern healthcare where I've been able to pursue that in a bit more depth. So it's a beat that I'm really passionate about and really excited to discuss some of those topics with you today. Outstanding. I think it's, uh, I myself, I started uh, in healthcare as an IT uh, tech and then moved up to an IT director for the largest private cardiology group in St. Louis. And, you know, it becomes baked into my fabric of what I look for when I'm browsing, you know, healthcare journals and articles about the latest trends. But as we, you know, as we see across the industry, I, I found that the audience for that is is expanding to CEOs, CFOs, especially CFOs, right? Because they're the ones who have to have to pay for it. Have you seen that as well in terms of, you know, your readership? Are you able to glean kind of who's reading and, and where they are in the spectrum? And have you noticed changes over time? Definitely. I think that's been something I've been really fascinated by as I've been covering the space for the past few years. Uh, just felt like originally a lot of whenever tech topics came up, it was automatically seen as part of the CIO's responsibilities. And while that's still, of course, the the case right now that the CIO is overseeing the tech projects, it, it has been interesting to see the way that technology has permeated throughout the organization. It's definitely a CEO level concern, a board level concern. Uh, one thing that's been interesting is I recently reported an article on uh, patient-facing apps, and it was interesting to see how for some hospitals that was a responsibility that fell under the chief digital officer. For some, it was under a patient experience role. For some, it was a marketing role. It, it's been interesting to see how tech has just kind of permeated throughout uh, every every department, every aspect of the hospital, and the way that that's implemented can definitely be under the purview of different folks at a system. Yeah. And I think, you know, as we roll into our by the numbers segment, I think we see that it it uh, increasingly, you know, it impacts the physician. And as we all know, with, uh, you know, the rollouts of EHRs and other uh, physician centered applications where they lead it more and more, the physicians are finding their voice. Right. They want a seat at the table um, when these decisions are being made. And and I have to say, working at at Caravan Health, where you know, back in the day, a lot of times decisions were just made at the CEO or the C-suite level, and perhaps a CMO was involved, but a lot of times they weren't. And now we've even seen a shift over the last three years with our clientele where not only is the CMO involved, but we as a company are actively recruiting other physicians to take an active role in the decision-making process, whether it's to hire us in our services or, you know, looking at technology that they're going to be using uh, to care for their patients. You know, we want them to be happy. And so rolling into our numbers segment, unless you're brand new to the field, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that digital health delivery is increasingly a large and important part of our healthcare landscape. And over the past 20 years, use of electronic health records has grown enormously, not only due to federal requirements, but also because of significant public and private investments, some of which are actually physician-owned companies, right? Some EHRs came out and they burned a lot of providers, and so providers went into the business of creating their own EHRs. Uh, I think in 2004, we found that less than 25% of office-based physicians were using any kind of electronic medical record. And today, it's, it's more than 80%. I mean, it's ubiquitous across the industry, especially if uh, you have a high-volume practice, such as in primary care. Um, and the majority of those are certified by the Office of the National Coordinator, which means that they are meeting federal requirements for keeping information secure and working through interoperability with other EHR uh, applications so that you can have a electronic communication of care. But there are a lot of different systems out there. I think on average, we see hospitals and their affiliated employed physician groups running on average about 16 different EHR systems across all of their specialties and subspecialties. I myself, back when I was in private industry, um, one of my clients uh, who wasn't very large as, as an enterprise system, rural hospital, uh, with their independent providers that they provided support for. They had six different EHRs that their IT team was having to support at any one time. So it's definitely a lift. And I think during the pandemic, we've seen the reliance on technology just grow even more. Telemedicine, of course, 
uh, is the is the prime growth um, vector. And according to a recent report on the state of telemedicine, telehealth will account for more than twenty nine point three billion dollars of medical services due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And that up to one hundred and six billion dollars of U.S. healthcare spend could be delivered through virtual services by twenty twenty three. So, I mean, this is not only significant investment by by the individuals delivering care, but even payers, private and public, are going to have to change their their billing um, and reimbursement amounts to to accommodate for these sort of virtual visits. The same report estimated that 20 percent of all medical visits would be conducted by telehealth during 2020. And we found that just monitoring the blogosphere data from UC Health in Colorado seems to confirm that they showed that in their system, telehealth visits hit a peak in April of 2020, with two thirds of their clinic appointments being performed virtually. So people had to change on a dime. And I think for the most part, those that had the will did so. And they found unique and innovative ways to, uh, to connect with their patients. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, Jessica, I mean, those are our numbers that kind of set the stage. But as you're reporting, you know, do you find that, that the topics of how much this is costing or the physician pain points or just how great some and how cool, to be perfectly honest, and to be a little nerdy, some of the technology is. I mean, what what seems to be rising to the top of like the stories that you're reporting on? Definitely. I think one thing that's kind of cool about this time of year is that we're, we're right at the point where there's a lot of reports and data coming out about full year 2020. And it's just so striking what a landmark year 2020 was across the board when it comes to technology. Um, uh, telehealth is something you just touched on, of course, that was a huge uh, sea change in the past year. Uh, Teladoc Health, uh, one of the largest telehealth companies recently reported uh, 1.1 billion in 2020 revenue, which was nearly double the revenue it had reported in 2019. So seeing how some of those telehealth tr trends are gonna continue is top of mind. Um, IBM Security recently released a report saying that cyber attacks on healthcare more than doubled in 2020. Again, a, uh, I don't know if I want to call cyber attacks, attacks a trend, but something that I know is top of mind for a lot of healthcare executives this year. So 2020 was just a year with so many changes in so many directions, and it'll be interesting to kind of continue tracking those as we move into 2021. I think uh, one of the fascinating things as I sit back on my career in the industry is just how much physicians initially resisted, you know, when these technologies came out and now some of them can't live without it, right? We all have the iPhones in their pockets. They're checking things now, whether or not they're being forced to, or whether or not it's just a part of their practice, but as these new technologies come out and as, as you're seeing, you know, new adoption of these great technologies when they, when they hit it, are you still getting, you know, comments to your articles uh, from physicians who are pushing back? Yeah, I would say I'd push back on the characterization of, uh, you know, physicians not wanting to embrace technology a little bit. I think some of the early concerns from physicians or uh, really from anyone in any job, anytime uh, you have leaders at the organization giving you or telling you to change your workflow in a way that is potentially taking more time on your end and where you're not seeing the, the kind of benefits that are expected firsthand, that can be really tough. And I think one thing that organizations have really brought more top of mind in recent years is the realization that when you're rolling out some of these new technology projects, bringing the physicians or whatever staff members that's going to affect into the conversation as early as possible, getting those physician champions, uh, explaining what's going to change, why, level setting expectations. And I think in those cases, that can be really helpful just so that it feels more like uh, the clinical staff are partners in this instead of uh, feeling like they're being told what to do from above. And I, I do think that that's, that's been helpful. There's definitely some things with uh, AI tools that are supposed to help with documentation, make the documentation burden easier for physicians that have been getting some uh, positive reviews from physicians, so to speak. I know 
something that comes up a lot on the clinical front is uh, robotic surgery and the way some of those tools have become so important for surgeons over the past few decades. So I definitely do think there is there's high adoption among technologies, among physicians, as long as there is an understanding of kind of what the end goal is. I think that's a tremendous point. And you bring up something that I remember back when I was in one of my master's classes, we had a guest speaker come in who was an HR um, president. And, and he said, you know, in his entire career of working in the industry of employment and, and visiting with people who are having challenges and not, he says, it's not that in his mind mm-hmm. that people fear change. It's that they just want someone to acknowledge their loss whether it's the loss of time, the loss of comfort, the loss of, you know, being the expert and having to learn something new. And I thought it was very profound because I think in healthcare, sometimes it's that way. Uh, My previous uh, uh, boss here inside of Caravan Health, uh, he was a CEO for Rural Hospital. And he said he's never met a physician who would be willing or not willing to adopt a better drug or a better surgical procedure if it has better outcomes and things like that. But you have to be willing to sit down and walk them through that as to what's the need there. Why is this better? As opposed to just throw it on them and tell them on Monday at 8 a.m. you need to do it. So it's, uh, you know, very, very important. I think that as everybody, whether or not it's uh, technology or not, you, what you said is, is right on. Bring them to the table so that they can see it from, from the beginning, uh, that they can understand why it's, it's being requested of them. And then more importantly, perhaps even down to the granular nature of how it's going to impact their day to day. And perhaps even most important, who's going to support them, right? If it's, a, if it's simply a phone call to a, a help desk, that's probably not the best way to roll out new technology right? A lot of physicians need side by side because their day's busy and they want someone to shadow them while they're walking. Well, recently, our ACO medical director, Dr. John Finley, had published an article on technology as the newest social determinant of health. Have, have you started to see technology or access to healthcare really um, emerge as a barrier for patients in accessing care? Or would you say, you know, that barriers are there, but they're, they're as siloed as ever? I think that that's a really great point in terms of thinking about technology as a social determinant of health. Uh, One of my colleagues at Modern Healthcare, Stephen Ross Johnson, actually just wrote an article on internet as the latest social determinant of health. And it it is one of those things that I think hospitals and healthcare executives in general have started to need to think about uh, on the surface, of course, if we're going to be moving to a system in which more patients are going to be accessing their care via telemedicine, uh, specifically via video visits, uh, that does mean that we'll have to figure out whether patients across populations have access to high-speed internet, either you know individually if they can afford to be paying for that, or there's definitely some regions in the U.S. where just the infrastructure for high-speed internet isn't really available. So that's something just on the surface is something I think we're, we're grappling with in healthcare right now. And then even beyond that, as technology and the internet become more intertwined with our daily lives, I, I think it's also underpinning a lot of other social determinants of health. Uh, for example, right now for my job, I, like many other people during the pandemic, have been working remotely just with my laptop uh, in my apartment, which is possible because of internet access, but again, might not be possible in all regions of the US or for all populations. So really thinking about the way internet access and technology access more broadly affects some of the other social determinants of health that we've already known about for a while, like job security, education, things like that. Yeah, I, you know, you can't look at the rural versus urban divide and in rural could be 30 miles outside of a major city. But if, you know, if you're in Louisiana and there's a bayou between you and that city, it's kind of hard to run fiber, you know, sometimes through a bayou. And, and so even 30 miles away from a metropolitan area where you would think, you know, surely there's got to be rural broadband, um, it, it may not be there because of geography. So 
that and age, right? And it's not that senior Americans aren't using smartphones as much as everybody else, but our Medicare patients, especially the very elderly, you know, they may have conditions. My mother, rheumatoid arthritis, right? So she, it's hard to use a smartphone. So is there a, you know, are there physical challenges related to the conditions that they want to be treated for via telemedicine that actually prevent them from using those services? And then how do, you know, if you move full scale into uh, telemedicine adoption, how, you know, how do you train your staff to do the one-offs then? Instead of the one-off being the telemedicine visit, the one-off is what do we do for that person that can't use it? And it's a, it's a fascinating, you know, tipping point where we're at. I mean, my son is 11 years old. I think it's by the time he's probably my age, the Xbox that he plays, he'll have a little avatar. And if it's time for him to go in to see an orthopedic to get his shoulder worked on, his avatar will probably, you know, be pointing at his shoulder, reminding him that he has a doctor visit, right? <laughs> I mean, we could be that integrated in 30, 40 years from now. Definitely. And I think a big part of patient engagement also has to be meeting patients where they are while telemedicine and some of these digital uh, tools we've been talking about, uh, like apps can be really helpful. There, there is the question of whether patients want to use them. Uh, for example, I know my grandmother is right now trying to schedule getting the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, I was able to do some research on the internet, figure out how to schedule that online, who to be emailing. But she personally just, she does not, she doesn't have an email address. She doesn't really like being on the internet and, and that's her choice. And there has to, has to be ways to meet those people where they are. Yeah. And, and that actually goes to some reporting you've done, right? You've done reporting about patient-friendly hospital apps that patient actually want to use. And, you know, to talk about not only finding a way to engage perhaps patients who have never used the technology before, but if we, if we lift up to the 50,000, you know, point view, why are we using these apps? One, we're trying to make it easier for everybody. Two, I think there's a, a cost element of this, right? If we can have online scheduling, appointment setting, you know, uh, look up your results, does it minimize the staff burden on the hospitals? As we all know, hospitals now have to have their price books out there. Medicare is cutting rates. Uh, every other payer is trying to cut rates and things like that. What do you see as the role of the patient engagement technology when it comes to, to costs or you know, improving even the physician-patient relationship? Definitely. When it comes to costs, there, there is certainly a role for a technology to play there. Um, like you mentioned, the ability to do some self-scheduling via an app could cut down on the amount of time that a call center or a scheduling center needs to be doing there. I know something that's come up a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic is chatbots. And a lot of the times these apps that hospitals roll out for patients will involve chatbots. Uh, I spoke with a hospital a few weeks ago that said they were getting a ton of calls from patients just confused about the COVID-19 vaccine, wanting some clarity about who was eligible to get it at the hospital, uh, how scheduling would work. And one of the tools they rolled out to uh, deal with that since uh, so many of their call centers were getting overrun with those types of questions was to roll out an online chatbot that could answer some of those questions. So definitely some amount of work that can be redirected through automation. And then I guess one of the other interesting things that I've seen when it comes to trends in patient facing apps is how a lot of them have expanded beyond just the patient's interaction with the hospital and starting to encompass a patient's general health and wellness. Um, there's hospitals like Advocate Aurora in the Midwest that tie in kind of healthy eating resources into their app. Um, El Camino Health in California is adding tools to its app that help to guide a patient through care for things like pregnancy and surgery with reminders. And all of those are interventions that can help to keep patients healthier, make it hopefully easier to adhere to their care plans and in the long run will hopefully help to keep costs down. That's intriguing, you know, in terms of the changing a patient visit or patient experience from this acute episode, right? I go in, I schedule, I go and I see the doc and I'm done until my next visit to, to trying to keep 
active engagement, right? You've had surgery, let's follow up with you every week, every two weeks, every three weeks. I mean, is that the role that AI has in the future of healthcare? Or is this still, do you think, going to be driven by people behind the scenes? Or both, right? Nurses calling, or, or is it going to be more automated by AI? That's a great question. I would say definitely, definitely both. Anytime that there is an AI intervention that's going to be doing something like interacting with patients or sending reminders to patients, there definitely has to be kind of a second layer of if the AI picks up something that's uh, potentially bad and needs to be leveled up to a real person, that that process is, is, is set up ahead of time so that there are uh, people with the right knowledge, uh, particularly clinical knowledge, interacting with the patient. Um, that said, there is so much potential for AI in healthcare, um, so much data in healthcare, and AI definitely has a role to play in making sense of that data. Just always has to also, like we were talking about earlier, uh, these types of systems have to be developed and rolled out in collaboration with the clinicians that are most familiar with patients and what needs to be done in these care plans so that they are implemented responsibly. Yeah. And of course, the downside to this is that the more technology you have, the more chance there is for something to go wrong. Recently, you reported on a data breach in Texas that affected more than 600,000 patients. So whether or not it's an AI chat software that you've implemented in EHR or you know, bring your own device from home, how do we address and prepare, for, you know, for for this increase of technology? What are you seeing that either enterprises are doing or that the vendors themselves are trying to do? I'd say the first thing is always um, education, staff education. Uh, if there's a device that a patient's bringing home, then patient education, just to make sure the users of the technology understand how to uh, prevent against any uh, of these big cyber attacks, we've been seeing a, a huge root cause of a lot of data breaches today is, well, of course, the root cause ultimately is the hackers who are hacking into the systems. But a big issue is uh, email phishing, where a scammer will uh, email a staff member posing as someone legitimate, like their employer, and then staff member might accidentally click on a link that deploys some malware. And just making sure that staff are aware of those risks, how to, how to notice when something might not be legitimate and just overall making sure that people uh, know what to look out for. That's probably one really big defense that's important. And then also just investing into cybersecurity. I think cybersecurity can be hard sometimes because with a lot of technology initiatives, you invest a certain amount of money and then you over time hope to see a specific ROI, but for cybersecurity, a lot of the time it's investing into cybersecurity and with with the end goal of basically things staying as they are, staying safe. And mm -hmm. it, it can be hard to sometimes keep in mind that when you're making those investments, the ultimate goal is to make sure that if there if there was a breach down the line, that's something that could result in, first of all, financial issues, but also loss of patient trust, things like that. So it's a very preventive thing to have to be investing into. Yeah. I mean, right. It doesn't matter if you're a brick and mortar retailer, you need security systems. Be, and you're right. That's not going to make you money, but hopefully it prevents the loss of a lot of money. So it is something that, uh, you know, as people, I can tell you back as an IT director, those sort of things, even back in the day, because I'm old, uh, back in the day, the investment in even antivirus wasn't something that physician groups wanted to spend because they're like, how does that help us make money? And, and we weren't fully virtualized like we are today. And so it was very easily to compartmentalize a, a complaint or an objection to spending on those sort of software or router securities and uh, outside services to help you monitor your networks. But today, hopefully, Every physician, every enterprise understands that the risks are real. Ransomware is horrible. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, but you, I'm sure you have no lack of stories. Uh, I'm sure that you could uncover and, and report on. Um, so what, what are some of the other challenges, though? You've got cybersecurity, but as we move to a more fully integrated digital system, 
you know, is it staffing? Is it patient support with the technology? What do you think? Definitely. I'd say one of the major challenges is kind of like we discussed earlier, uh, keeping in mind meeting patients where they are. So even though you might be rolling out a patient engagement app, that doesn't mean uh, getting rid of the call center, getting rid of uh, a web portal. Those things also uh, play a role in, uh, you know, there's some patients who prefer to do things one way, some that prefer to do things another way. I also would say from a, a user support is really important for patients who might be interested in using an app, but maybe they're not familiar with smartphones. Maybe they're not familiar with apps, making sure that there's a help desk set up to answer questions for those patients so they can get whatever information they're looking for in the way they want to be able to do so. And I think as, as more as different types of technology options start to arise, uh, you know, with kind of in-person care, virtual care, AI, ch- AI chat apps, all these kinds of things, it'll be important to make sure that patients understand how to use these different options and when the best time for each of these options might be. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it educating the patient as to the importance of them. I'm very curious if, if there are going to be team, you know, is that going to be turf to the MA, the medical assistant or the nurse or the physician or some other person inside of the health system to fully drive home the importance of that, you know, is if you're a diabetic patient working with a diabetic educator, you know, is it, I could imagine it becomes part and parcel to every conversation they have that says, here's our app that talks about proper foods and, you know, the, the glycemic index and all that good stuff. Um, and it's right here at your fingertips. So there's no excuse for, you know, not knowing. Um, but it's, it's more interesting to me at the point of acute care, right? You know, I have an appendix issue. It comes out. I'm very curious to see how those sort of things over time uh, get baked in and fully distilled. And, and again, how systems, health systems, including the small rural ones, uh, will staff and fund those, those kind of support efforts. Um, well, you know, we're, we're kind of approaching our time, but I wanted to ask you, so what do you think is the biggest thing on the horizon for digital healthcare? Is it Amazon drones delivering, uh, you know, prescriptions or other durable medical equipment? Is it uh, AI chatbots or, or something else? As basic as it might seem, I think the main thing that I think a lot of healthcare executives are watching right now is what's next for telehealth. We saw this huge rise in 2020, and I think it'll be interesting to see, uh, hopefully, as the pandemic uh, starts to subside, what that levels off at, kind of what the new normal is. Is it still uh, kind of a massive amount of telehealth visits? Is it healthcare organizations Uh, retooling care processes to be more of a hybrid model. Regulation, of course, is going to play a huge role in that since uh, Medicare still doesn't reimburse for some of the video visits that it seems like patients might be wanting. And Mm -hmm. kind of another component of that is a lot of the telehealth companies like Teladoc and Amwell have started launching uh, virtual primary care programs and seeing if that's the kind of thing that consumers, particularly younger consumers, might be interested in. So just seeing how all of that shakes out and what the quote unquote new normal is for for healthcare when it comes to in-person versus virtual is going to be something that we're looking at this year and likely for the next few years. Yeah, I, you know, having had some virtual visits myself, I don't ever want to leave, you know, my house. And I can imagine we talked about this in our last episode, talking about some of the uh, burdens on financial burdens on on patients trying to seek access. And it goes right to do I have to leave my job right to go get care. And you can see hopefully a day where if you're in a big office building, there's a dedicated room for this. You know, we made big strides, I, I think, in helping working mothers who are, who are new mothers, you know, where, where you have a room, a private room, where they can go and, and uh, pump for their babies and, and things like that. And I think 
hopefully the future of medicine is not for if you're, you know, carrying an acute bacterial infection right to work, you don't want to do that. But, you know, if you kind of wrenched your shoulder and you need a telemedicine call, so you don't have to take two hours out of your day to go across town to the doctor and wait in a waiting room, hopefully that becomes just integrated into our everyday care delivery model and therefore into the work model. Um, I think we are fortunate, you and I, we get to work from home, especially during this pandemic, but there are so many others who can't. And it would be great if we could see a shift to getting healthcare delivered to, you're absolutely right, meet them where they are. And uh, that would be a big thing for us. Well, Jessica, it has been truly a pleasure having you on Healthcare by the Numbers. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience? I just say it's been great being here. It's an exciting time in digital health, to say the least. And I know I'm excited to see what's next. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. For our audience, if you'd like to learn more about Jessica and her reporting, you can check her out on Modern Healthcare site at modernhealthcare.com. And you can follow her on Twitter at Jessica Kim Cohen and at Modern Healthcare, which is actually spelled M-O-D-R-N, Health C-R. So, and for everyone, I want to thank you for listening today. I'm your host, Todd Searles for Caravan Health and Healthcare by the Numbers. Until next time, take care.